Hi everyone, uh, and welcome to part three of our ESG Masterclass series, hosted by Benchmark ESG. Thank you for all of us for taking the time and joining us today. Uh, it's really nice to see all the familiar names back here, people who've been with us from part one and here today on part three, and also some newer people. Uh, very nice to see all of you and a very, very warm welcome to everybody. Our Masterclass is certified which means that if you attend all five sessions from November 2022 to March 2023, you will receive a certificate after part five in March. Now we're looking forward to see you through the rest of the journey with us as well. Now, some of you may have missed out on attending part one and two of our webinar series, but uh, no worries there. We do have a way for you to be eligible to still learn the muscular certificate. Uh, so please wait until the end of the webinar, and that's where we'll have the big reveal on how you can go ahead and still on your certificate. Uh, as we've brought up before, uh, at Benchmark ESG, we conceptualize this masterclass to help you, our community of business leaders, understand ESG better and take charge in confidently taking climate action, as well as ensuring that our people live safer and healthier lives. Uh, with that, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Alicia Vas. I'm a lead business development specialist at Benchmark ESG Private Limited. And I'm very excited to be bringing my passion for ESG as well as communications to be your masterclass coordinator today. Uh, now, for over two decades now, Benchmark ESG's cloud based digital EHS and ESG solutions have helped businesses manage safe and sustainable operations worldwide and digitally transform the environmental health and safety sustainability supplier and product stewardship programs and all of this under the larger umbrella of ESG. And that brings us to part three today. Uh, at Benchmark, we always say that an organization's most important assets are their employees, as well as the larger community of people that a business impacts. And hence, uh, the S in ESG, the webinar today is very special to us. And here is our ESG Masterclass team. Now, a lot of you may already be familiar with them uh, by now, but quick introductions for anybody who isn't. Uh, we have with us Mr. Shankar Rajagopalan. Shankar is an ESG expert and our Masterclass lead for the series. Shankar is an environment, health, safety, quality, and sustainability professional with more than 36 years of experience. He's currently an ESG consultant and expert who has extensive experience working as the previous ESG head at Granules India Limited and in EHS and sustainability roles at Dr. Reddy's, Pfizer, Tata Projects, and Sterling and Wilson. Uh, so nice to have you back here, Shankar, and thank you for joining us. And also joining us are our digital ESG experts. On our team is Chandan Tiwari. He's currently the Associate Director of APAC Subscriber Development at Benchmark ESG Private Limited. Uh, Chandan is a qualified EHS practitioner with experience with 13 years of experience in digital transformation, business integration, ESG, sustainability, occupational health, safety, and environment management system implementation. Uh, we also have with us today here Ayush. Ayush is a manager, subscriber development and engagement at Benchmark ESG. He's a mechanical engineer by profession and he has a master's in EHS. Uh, he also has experience working with ports and logistics and manufacturing firms prior to joining Benchmark. Ayush is today a GRI team sustainability professional with expertise in GRI, GHG protocol, and BRSR. Benchmark is also hosting this webinar in collaboration with the Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Now, here's a quick look at all the five parts. Uh, today, we are on part three. And uh, please block your calendars and don't forget to attend parts four and five and earn your masterclass certificate. A quick note uh, before we proceed. We are very excited to hear your thoughts and questions. Uh, please add any questions or comments in the chat box and we'll address them in the question and answer session at the end of the webinar today. Uh, just a moment. Um, Shankar will join us in just a few seconds and then he will be able to take you through the rest of the masterclass. Apologies, folks. 
uh, Alicia, could you continue sharing the screen if possible? Yeah, yes, I can do that, Shankar. Just a moment. Um, Apologies, folks. I think uh, in the transition from the 4G to 5G, the biggest social challenge is upon us. And I guess while I connected with a couple of hotspots, the Airtels and Vodafones, and I am in the cyber city, the tech hub of, uh, you know, where I guess it all starts. We still have a challenge in connecting, but welcome everybody to this uh, masterclass. Welcome everybody to this uh, third in the series of the demystification of ESNG. We will deep dive into the social, yeah. At the outset, sorry for the starting glitch. I guess there is a little bit of lag between uh, what we are saying and what's happening there. Yeah. As Elisa said, wonderful and thanks for joining. A quick recap on part three, what we did. We did a E of ESG. We looked at the key parameters. We looked at the key uh, material material at T factors of environment. We looked at some of what uh, are the most critical one. Typically, when we look at environment, we talk of the E factors and the critical E factors as a recap are the ones that look at carbon, water, waste. And also then we understood that from and where it all comes from, how do people prioritize? What is it that people look at? What are the key factors that people look at here? And that's how we got into the materiality factors, uh, understanding which some of the industry sectors, what is it that worked well for them? Uh, what are the critical ones that any company, regardless of its sector, talks about? And that's where we went into the carbon, water, and waste here. Yeah. So this is what you looked at, the small recap of part two. As we said, any of us who have attended them, uh, we will also share the... Uh, webinar recordings. So you'll be able to also get to understand more and also will try and help you get certified here. So how this all helped us, uh, and we talked of from the conference of parties, how all countries have started taking targets on net zero. We spoke about the transition from the COP26 at Glasgow to the COP27 at Egypt, and how a lot of companies are taking up focused environmental factors, how these key GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, we divided, explain what these are, how people looked at water, waste, very material to all of us, and of course, the context of biodiversity. And it all begins with environmental compliance. It is critical to look at the right framework to report the e matrix, and that's where we looked at some digital tools to help us capturing data and reporting on them. And that is, they say, the heart of where it all began. Like we said, ESG had its origins in sustainability, which looks at the operating parameters. And this is what we spoke about here, right? Yes, Parag, we will get the links over time. We will share the links with you and we'll be happy to share with this here. Mm -hmm. So friends, today we're looking at the overview of S in ESG, looking at the material S factors. S is the social. S is what is not so normally spoken about. S is also the most challenging component to assess and incorporate as per all standards there. Why social hard to report folks? Due to the large range of social factors and its quantitative and qualitative nature, it can be hard to measure its impact in quantitative terms. Also, there is a lack of standardization of S reporting. The social reporting is not very standardized, unlike environmental, which a lot of people take to like a fish to water. So investors often make assumptions and assign weightages to the social factors that you see out here. And that's where S factors are still being shaped and defined. And the S analytics is still work in progress. Though in reporting, a lot of people might not see, or you want to see more of social, it's all about the people, that bottom line is the most critical one. A lot of the investors agree that the S factors are the most challenging component to address and incorporate in various analysis there. So the social factor talking of, and we'll deep dive into each of these are the health and safety. You can't do a business impact in the health and safety of a workforce. Diversity and equal opportunity, uh, that's something that we're talking of. DEI and DNI are the terms that is very popular, very common. And the basic compliance for where it started, human rights, labor practices. They talk of CSR and a lot of people, when they talk of uh, sustainability or ESG, 
or CSR is what comes to the mind. So we'll also address that element of this. So today is what we're trying to uh, deep dive into each of these social elements, right? So these are the typical types of S issues for companies. And this is what comes to mind when people talk of occupational health and safety risks. That's the first one. Let's look at this as it comes through. Yeah. So the occupational health and safety, it all begins there. And if you look at compliances and statutes, it all, you know, understanding what are the hazards, what can go wrong, what are the presence of hazards. A couple of examples would be the physical and chemical hazards. In the last couple of years, the Black Swan event has told us there's a lot of biological hazards also, the pathogens, as we speak, the wave five or perhaps the wave six is upon us. And in the pandemic, across some of us, in the way that we work in different scenarios, the psychological hazards also has been coming place in demanding work environments there. One of the companies that embodies ESG in a corporate way, in a consistent way, has been ITC. And the one company that's been carbon, water, waste neutral since decades, this is where the ESG triple bottom line has been embodied by ITC. Is you aware that ITC began as the British tobacco company then went on to be called the Indian tobacco company and now just called the ITC. The way that it has focused on the triple bottom line has really changed the narrative on ITC. And one of what they've done well on the social front, apart from the chocolate and some of the initiatives they've taken, ITC has structured an EHS approach to improve the health and safety across all business functions. I had the opportunity to work with them uh, with some of the chains, including the uh, facilities, uh, the paper mills and the hotels, where their challenge has always been to go beyond compliance. They're always trying to be ahead of the expectations to develop a behavioral centric culture to ensure that zero accidents is not just a bumper sticker, but an expectation that they have, which is overarching. And a focus there is the governance that manages the entire environment, health and safety processes there. So zero accidents doesn't happen by default, it happens by design. And some of the ways they've designed these initiatives, they look at enterprise-wise reporting of incidents. And they always say that you've got to learn from yesterday's bad news. How do you do that? By investigating and understanding what has gone wrong. And they've done it through a single digital platform to track all the incidents, to ensure that the learning from incidents are cascaded across in a manner that is seamless, where the learning opportunities yeah. is across all the businesses, all the entities of the company here. The other aspect is looking at tomorrow's headlines. What could go wrong tomorrow by employee engagement in exercises like risk assessment, ensuring that people understand it's all about the safety observation and a conversation. They're talking of safe and unsafe actions to look at lead indicators in the most proactive sense to identify incident prevention opportunities to prevent accidents from tomorrow. So one is the lag on root cause analysis, having a perfect platform to understand and go to the systemic causes of incidents. And again, done in a manner that is very, very uh, nice cross country done. The second one is total employee engagement in understanding, identifying unsafe actions, at risk behaviors, and like we said, incident prevention opportunities. And of course, how do you check the audits across all sites, not only design, construction, and operations at regular intervals there. So this means some of the uh, best practices that we've seen, and I had the pleasure of assessing them at some stage. So through the health and safety efforts, uh, 37 of ITC's manufacturing units and hotels and offices have been able to maintain a zero on-site lost time incident performance. And this is something that is done consistently across the last five years. And I guess this is something that speaks volumes, the outcomes. But again, it's not just about the lag, it's about the efforts they made to fix the foundation of the pyramid by the first three of what we just discussed here. They also had a great outcome, uh, good five-star ratings in health and safety management system by the British Safety Council. So good talking point of company that largely focuses on sustainability. And that's what you know in ITC for, uh, from their annual general body meetings to how uh, in the earlier past, they wish were their chairman, you should speak about the triple bottom line, even in the AGM. And the way that the annual report is structured way ahead of time, uh, safety is where they began from. So getting... Health and safety as a starting point is what has been the best part for ITC. So that's one of the case studies there. Yes. 
Right. Okay. So while ITC has been a good example in uh, what's worked well in health and safety, uh, we also are aware of this typical uh, pyramid uh, called the Frank Bird Pyramid, the Conoco Pyramid, the Hendrich Pyramid. You know what it is all about? They say that before that one big incident, the one big fatality happens, there is a series of you know, other categories of incidents, be it uh, 30 lost time incidents, uh, 300 minor injuries, 30,000 illnesses, and possibly three lakhs unsafe actions, unsafe patients there. This is called the statistical pyramid. Which might work differently for different countries, but how this works here, it could be more truncated in design and construction and perhaps in various industries. The way you best look at it is the example that you see on the here, the entry chart. You could start with the number of incidents you might have had in the past year and you begin with the most severe of them, the fatality, and then try and extrapolate based on the same thumb rule. If these two fatalities, you should have had how many? Six lakhs unsafe actions and conditions. And you can see the actual there, and you can try and draw the correlation that there is more that we can do. So the more we monitor and report unsafe actions and conditions, you can facilitate better safety behavior. And the more that you involve non-safety professionals, involve the line managers, involve in the larger part of the workforce, the better your incident statistics will be. So the entire journey, as you spoke about leading rather than lagging, comes when you're able to fix the foundation of the pyramid by making it flatter, broader, and if you're able to identify them and also investigate them to the level that you understand what is the cause of them, you'll be able to prevent the bigger incidents from happening there. So in a sense, to summarize this, uh, it's of course, it doesn't mean to say that if you have six lakhs, you'll be able to, you know, you'll have two fatalities. You can prevent those. You can prevent across the uh, pyramid. You can prevent the uh, minor injuries, lost time injuries, and of course the fatalities by observations. They say that awareness is the first step of risk mitigation. So what this entire approach is, is all about the safety observation and intervention, a conversation, and of course, the way that we'll be able to prevent this here by understanding identification of that. So they say that organization that has an open and transparent platform for reporting has the best chance of having a zero incident kind of platform. There. Yeah. So that's the Henrich pyramid demystified. Go ahead. So I guess there are various industries uh, where occupational health and safety is a material factor and there's something that would be logical there. Although it's not something that comes up straight, people tend to look at the environmental more so. But, you know, in engineering construction industries, where there's heavy exposure to machine, heavy machines and accidents, hazardous chemicals, expenses, uh, incidents that lead to heavy downtime. Of course, manufacturing is one where there is a lot of man-machine interface hazards like electrical hazardous materials, and there's a need for a lot of hazard identification training in activities like operations of coal. There could be exposures uh, that lead to miners having chronic lung diseases and also mental health problems. I worked in the mine industry there, cave-ins, explosions, and of course, even in waste management where there's a lot of transportation happening, exposure, and therefore the compliance aspects of those also come in, including road transportation. These are the large industries where Occupational health and safety is a key material factor. So as we said, we'll try and give examples across each of these. Yeah. And there are various leading practices across each of these. And I think we'll speak about these in each of the uh, sub dimensions of health and safety. Yeah. And we'll come back to that. We'll also explain and articulate what are the leading uh, players in each of these. We try to give an industry example out here that tells you how this works in various industries there. Yeah. Go ahead. So they say, and uh, in the places that we are, uh, B and I, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they speak about social. When they speak about social, it's also important that you understand why this is critical here. As we speak, I'm in a tech industry where diversity, equity, and, and inclusion is so critical that what exactly is D, E, and I? So diversity is not just the gender, it's about race, ethnicity, nationality, 
orientation, sexual orientation, abilities or otherwise. It's a lot more about that. The more diverse a team, the more insights you have, the more cross-functional the team is, the better it is. Inclusion is about creating a workplace that ensures inclusive opportunities there for flexible working, equal opportunities for everyone. In a typical meeting, you want everyone to come in with a voice. Everyone has an opinion. You need everyone to voice them. And that's where you need to be proactively seeking those opinions there. How do you source what you do ethically? How do you ensure that you're a fair player? How do you also look at where you're working in the community they're working in? How do you ensure that you support the local communities? Because you are here where the communities are. In a lot of situations, and I'll give example of a case study or doctor it is, uh, there were facilities that you know, 30 years ago, which began in some industrial estates, as time went across, the communities grew upon them. So now the industries are encroaching in the communities. And there is, for example, a hydrogenation plant right next to a building complex there, which came up to an issue there. So these are the challenges of time and how this is very important for us. And of course, this is about ensuring that we take care of these. You understand what is equity, friends? You are aware of this vaccine as we speak. And you know that in India, we have the question that we ask wherever you go, how many vaccines do you have? Have you taken the booster? You're also aware there are some parts of the world, the third world countries, where they forget the booster. They're not even got the, the, the basic vaccine there. And there are some countries that have, been, have sat on stocks, which have got depleted, got shelf life expiry, not got used at all. So, but equity is all about ensuring that the haves and the have nots kind of bridge the gap. So, this is about B, E, and I. And one of the best case studies is an example in Dr. Reddy's. And I was at some point in time, a decade ago, uh, into this journey of uh, sustainability there. And one of the things I remember saying was in one of the reports, we had mentioned our D, E, and I. We talked about our gender diversity and ratio. After the report was published, I was aware that every publication, every disclosure, has some input, some feedback. It goes into the public domain. And this is where we got in calls from one of the data analysts, sustainability analyst, to be clear, asking us what was the DDI philosophy? What was the percentage plan? What was the approach? And at that point in time, although we had nicely published in a spirit of disclosure, what where our percentage of gender ratio was, we realized that we didn't have some of the answers there. But having said that, the advantage and the power of disclosures is if you're open and transparent, you go back and understand. And that's where we had a chat with the CEO and the entire leadership team, the CHRO, and discuss what would be a strategy there. So now 10 years hence, uh, I think Dr. Reddy is 27% uh, of the board of directors are women. Uh, the only pharma company, they can say proudly that it's listed on the gender equality index of the top seven companies and the goals 35% in the senior leadership, that's three times the current by 2030, gender parity, you know what that means. These are, you know, what some things you would not imagine there, except for the fact that we began this journey and that's how the entire progression works. Again, uh, as one of the questions came up in the chat, how do you look at the best practices? What are the leading way? I think this is very important to understand that this is how you begin there. And I guess this is the story of how Dr. Reddy's, like I said, my own journey across where it started and where it began to the you know, data that you have there, one of the top companies to be listed in the gender equality index. So that's how D, E, and I pans out in various industries and a wonderful case study that you see in one of the best pharma companies you can think of here. So that's on diversity, equity, and inclusion, one of the key parameters. Even when you look at your own supply chain, uh, your own teams here, how cross-functional is it? And we spoke about even in you know, that we talk about the risk assessment, uh, we spoke about how people do investigations, even in those aspects, if you're able to get a cross functionality, able to get a diversity into teams, this is where you'll be able to connect and get voices coming in here. So that's the reason why uh, DEI is pretty core and one of the key materiality factors on social there. Right, cool. And I guess uh, there's been various uh, uh, feedbacks also, and uh, uh, Eon APAC Pulse Survey uh, the year before last I spoke about uh, the changes in the organization uh, uh, that people are making to strengthen DEI across over 450 respondents. You can see that the expanding talent pools is something that people are looking at for candidate diversity. Typically, in a setup, you'll have 
more of the usual, the more of the usual people, the local communities, local people, you try to look at hiring and try and be selecting people who are locally there. But it begins with identifying, communicating the objectives and commitments. It always begins with the approach, but how we kind of improve this and take actions to manage DEI has come across a big talking point. So you can see across the uh, feedback, even from most of the companies there, DNI is taking top priority there. You can see the more diverse workforce, even in the kind of companies you're working with, if you go back to something years ago and look at your people there, who are the people who are part of the teams, be it the leadership or even in the workforce down the line, even in terms of uh, uh, the uh, contractors, normally in various states, you normally source contractors and they come in from some part of the country, typically from the Northeast, and those are the people who normally come in. And there's a lot of business discontinuity and disruptions when there is festivals, holidays, and you need to source local people. So the it's a kind of combination of diversity means a combination of these, and this gives a nice snapshot into the trends that organizations look at to make DNI part of their initiative. There, all right. That's two critical themes here, and like we said, we will also, you know, talk about some industries as we speak. The tech industry, the software industry is the prime uh, industry where DNI is a material factor, uh, even as uh, some of the manufacturing entities here on the call will not relate to an uh, online working or work from home, it's back to business as usual. But in the way that people in the IT industries have taken to work at home and creating a diverse workplace has been one of the biggest uh, ways of getting diverse pools there to manage the uh, talent shortage. Advertising and marketing, obviously another, another industry where diversity to reach diverse global audiences, where you might be based even in a country that you are, but you, your audience could be across the world. Uh, Multiland retailers, distributors, as a policy, look at hiring and promoting uh, practices that align with the DI goals and as part of the expectations from people who fund them, uh, the kind of assessments they do on the social front, it also requires them to promote a culture that matters in DEA. An example, the talent pool there, because they have a change of providers. So these are some of the dominant industries where DEI are material factors. This is your flavor, friends, of how most industries or which sectors connect with some of these here. Right. So this is where it began. Uh, and we'll take some questions uh, as we go. We'll have a small chat. We'll explain and uh, some of this. But this is where we began for the entire demise of ESG began. And the UN guiding principles also said human rights are inalienable. They are given. They need to update uh, most critical anthropologies to voice here. And there are platforms like the Sustainable Standard that look at certification that encourages organizations to develop, maintain, and apply socially acceptable practices in the workplace. Some of you come from the World Cup, the big event that happened at the The human rights controversy that happened around the build up to happen, you're aware of there. So you can see why the success or failure or even is just of how it is. Uh, Shankar? Shankar, you're breaking up. We're unable to hear you. The last topics in the Chinese were a lot of severe challenges there. Apologies for the voice breach and again a social network challenge the times we are in. But you're aware that these are that affect the outcome of even good in there. Speak of good practices, but even before they started. And this was almost 100 years ago before industries actually set shop in India that have been part of the uh, various platforms. This entire integrity and 
employment fund, gratuity, provisions for labor, taking care of welfare. Hello, Shankar. So, apologies, friends, a small disconnect my but talking of example of Tata State, how they put in place the best practices, and again, uh, is really good to get that fixed. But the Tata Group and the Tata City, how they did what they did to get the best practices to start basic compliance. And some of the stories you hear from Jamshedpur is all the evidence of the fact that they did the right things to people. It's been the one company that was even the pandemic has put people up front here. So this has been one of the basic point. Tata as a culture, as a force of good, has always been the prime example. Tata Steel. And again, the other big story is it's not as if we need to do good practice or set a good standard. It's frozen in time. What happened at in Jampur uh, was something that was good. When they went into other entities, set up a new steel plant in another place there, it didn't work. The good, good offices, the good community initiated good labor weren't good enough for them to sustain the future here. And they, although you have to do good for the community, it's important also to understand that you need to begin afresh. Okay. Hi all, just a moment, we're waiting for Shankar uh, to fix his network and be back in a minute. Okay, me listen, folks. Hi Shankar, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so I'm talking about our group, Apple's friend, is, I am in the best place where the network is supposed to be best, but unfortunately there's a challenge there. So we spoke about uh, in over Tata Steel. Uh, Alicia, help me with the slide to get into human rights and we got talk about a steel example. And also that apart from the certification, social accountability and the principles, Tata Steel also is one of the few companies uh, on Shankar, human rights disclosures. Shankar, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think uh, your voice is still distorted. Okay. Try the air telephone. Can you hear this? Is this better? I think, yeah, Shankar, yes. this is no? much better. Yeah. yeah. So Tata Steel, I'll uh, help you navigate the slides. Tata Steel met the UN, UN Global Compact Human Rights Disclosure and has achieved the GC Global Compact Advanced Level, which is big here. So overall, just to summarize the labor practices on and human rights, I am on uh, the overall labor process. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So looking at overall labor practice and human rights, operations offering goods and services, laws, guidelines that help in reducing, minimizing, or no harm. If you look at a supplier or your own entity, these are some of the standard labor processes set up and talk of not just sexual harassment, but freedom of any kind of harassment, uh, freedom of association, the liberty you have, non-discrimination, of course, child labor, you not deploy child labor, but do your Across the ocean, is there any force labor? Is there a mechanism for people to speak? These are basic practices and human rights here. Yeah. So the prominent industry, the various industries where human rights and labor practices are material factors. Typically, the uh, automobile where workers and your is even India biggest examples as not well, that a major showdown. Uh, the big incident in Manisar, but workers under the unions, under the collective bargaining, need fair wages, safe working conditions, freedom of association, metals and mining operations, uh, again in conflict zones, we speak about blood diamonds in Africa and some parts of the country. Hello, hi Shankar. I 
think we lost you again. Metals and minings, bike and pharmaceuticals and apparel. Again, the sweatshops, including some of the uh, scenes, what you've seen in Bangladesh. <clears throat> These are the primary uh, industries where human rights and services Factors Shankar, Shankar, I think I think uh, it's it's still not working out. I think the voice is still distorted. Do you do you okay. want me to uh, uh, cover the uh, digital bit first while you can get this uh, sorted, Shankar? If, if that helps. that's a good idea, that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, we, go can, we can. I think that. before we get yeah, while yeah. we just covered most of it on the community development and uh -huh. overall uh, how we look at it uh, and stakeholder engagement, if we're able to look at the Overall perspective, that would be great here. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So I see, I think this now it was working fine. But yeah, uh, I, I'll go ahead and yes. quickly share my screen. If you uh, can please stop sharing, I can uh, share my screen. Alicia is sharing it. Yeah. yeah Alicia, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alicia, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yeah, we can. I wish. Yeah, yes. Perfect, yes. perfect, perfect. Uh, so hello, folks, and uh, everyone. And uh, thanks a lot, Shankar, for covering a bit of uh, the S part, the social part. Hope uh, you'll get uh, the network sorted. And we'll be back with the rest of the uh, social uh, material topics and aspects as well. So uh, what I have on my screen is the digital part of uh, is that we wanted to cover in today's session, the third masterclass session. And what I have on my screen uh, right now on the left are some of the material topics uh, from social aspect that Shankar just spoke about and some of the key disclosures under each of these topics as well. Uh, the list is even bigger. And uh, similarly, at the same time, you know, capturing them using a digital tool can also reduce the efforts by a major chunk as well. So there are primarily two ways of reporting these social matrices to an online tool, right? The first one is where you can access the web-based interface of the tool. And I'll quickly show you uh, the sustainability reporting tool that we have with Benchmark. And this is something that we also ran through the last time, wherein a user who uh, wants to key in the data for a particular month of an entity, uh, say for 2021 January month, he can quickly navigate through the tool and update that particular data. Once he clicks on that update button, he will see the list of KPIs or parameters that are material to his entities lined up here, right? So if I can just scroll to the bottom, I do have some of the social metrics also lined up here. So yeah, so this is the social section and under this we can keep on adding those, we can keep on uh, you know creating a repository of the material KPIs select the ones which are you know to be keyed in with data we can key in the usage for each of these kpis we can select the unit of measurements we can key in uh, where the data is coming from is it coming from an engineering estimate or a purchase record etc we can also uh, key in the associated cost with the right currency with some comments that we want to add into that uh, particular kpi data entry we can also look at adding some attachments. It can be a folder, it can be a Word document, it can be a photograph, it can be a URL as well, and saving that particular KPI. Uh, the user can do that for the entire set of uh, KPIs that he sees in this form and save all the inputs. Another way uh, of keying in the data is in a bulk manner where he can quickly go to Excel batch upload uh, option here and he can generate a template through which he can key in data for multiple months, multiple parameters, and for multiple entities in a single click of a button. He just have to key in the data to that particular Excel and upload that back to this particular uh, uh, you know, uh, module. So this is uh, one way of uh, keying in data where all the end data coming uh, from an operational process like say trainings or incidents or CSR activities, are fed and rolled up for the corporate to report, right? The second way uh, is to digitalize the entire process itself using a tool and allow the tool to push uh, necessary inputs directly to the sustainability reporting module that we just now saw. So you can see from the diagram on the right uh, where some of the ESG uh, parameters like the injury and illness data or supplier data or uh, let it be your training metrics or the conflict mineral related data 
can we actually pull in from some of the tools like uh, benchmarks, incident management tool or compliance calendar or uh, the training tracker or product stewardship. And these data can be directly fed into the sustainability reporting uh, modules like sustainability reporting and ESG director. Right? Uh, let me just quickly show you as an example. Uh, uh, if I go back and I pull up one of these modules, which is say incident management, and this is basically a management uh, uh, based tool, which will allow a organization to create a repository of all their accidents inside, inside uh, a facility. So as a user, as a uh, employee, you can quickly go and record an accident. You can target to a relevant uh, incident type. It can be an LTI, it can be an oil spill, et cetera. You can key in some basic information. You can key in some uh, description. You can key in the CVIT level. Uh, you can also tag some uh, photographs to this particular accident. You can also key in some root causes, uh, immediate causes. You can use the RCA tools, that is the root cause analysis tools, as well as you can also tag some uh, investigation team also using this particular application. Uh, once the investigations are over for that particular accident, you can also look at keying in some lessons learned as well as uh, creating a list of corrective action and tagging them to a responsible person for proper monitoring and closure of that particular uh, uh, incident. Now, all the EHS related ESG metrics like fatalities or LTIs or serious incidents, oil spills, or uh, near misses, et cetera, which will be captured by you in this application can be fed directly to the sustainability reporting module instead of you keying in the data on monthly basis manually. So at the end of the day, you are not just streamlining your operational and management processes, uh, like managing your incidents by digitalizing it end-to-end -end using this tool, uh, but you are also able to export the relevant ESG metrics to the tool, uh, to the sustainability reporting tool without any sort of manual intervention. So this is the first bit I wanted to cover. And apart from that, we also have uh, uh, something called that materiality advisor. So we already briefly touched upon uh, in this session and the last one also, how you can capture and manage the material data and conduct the analysis, right? We showed you some W reports also last time, how you can uh, look at analyzing your data and finding out which, which are the material topics or which are the material, uh, you know, uh, pain points for you. Another important aspect here is to assess the issues uh, <laughs> to identify the ones that are material to your organization for them again to be prioritized and disclosed in the public forum. And this is where a tool like uh, Materiality Advisor from Benchmark could be very helpful where it would allow you to create a repository of all your internal and inter uh, external issues it will also allow you to conduct assessments on each of these issues and rate them with your assessment scores. And finally, you can also take a look at a materiality summary to identify the material topics for your particular organization. Say with the current data that we have fed in this demonstration platform, uh, if I go to this particular materiality summary and uh, check the assessments with very high scope, I can quickly see that on the bottom, all the material topics or all, all the topics will get lined up and I can quickly go and uh, set the score to a descending order. And this will quickly show me which are the topics or which are the material topics that I should prioritize first, right? So you can see right now with the high score, 25, packaging and waste is my priority right now. This is something I should address first and hence it will become a material topic for me. And similarly would be, uh, employee health and well-being, uh, ethics and integrity, uh, bribery and corruption, data privacy, so on and so forth. So it's, it's completely dependent on the uh, organization to what extent they actually want to you know, consider or prioritize their material topics. Uh, so to summarize it up, I uh, quickly briefed on how you could leverage a digital tool like Materiality Advisor to uh, identify the material topics for your organization and two ways of basically feeding data of your social metrics. First, uh, by keying in the data directly to the reporting tool, to the sustainability reporting tool, through the web-based interface. 
And secondly, by digitalizing the entire process and allowing the tool to feed relevant data to the reporting tool automatically. Uh, so that was the digital bit that I wanted to cover. And with this, I uh, hope uh, Shankar, the network is back and uh, I'll quickly yeah. hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ayush. I think you uh, taken the deep dive uh, and I'm sure that this helps us a lot. Do enable screen sharing, please. Yeah. Super. Yeah. So friends, uh, this has been an interesting uh, discussion there and I see a lot of good in the chat box there. Thank you for the participation. So where human rights and this come from. I also spoke about some negative connotations where in spite of doing what you do, there are some things that affect the reputational companies because of good practices otherwise. Talking of the Olympics, talking of the Qatar Games and even the sponsors there, the impact also is very strong there. I'm sharing a screen, hope you can see that. And we try to summarize in as we closed out the best legal practices and what we do out here. So this is largely what we spoke about. To the industries, we spoke about this and we spoke about the sweatshops, the textile industries, and you can, some of these are case studies that we can get deep dive into. But it all began with the CSR and that's where after sustainability, community development and CSR has also had uh, been the reason why uh, sustainability has been key. The entire journey of stakeholder engagement, we'll talk about that, is also about corporate social responsibility, about a platform by which you can inform, consult, collaborate, and this is the important part of what is expected and also empower. You can see a lot of what we do, the approach we take to CSR, engaging with the local communities who are a very important stakeholder for the organization is very critical there. Involving them in a discussion, we spoke about this journey of Tata Steel in the case study, about how you know, a local community can impact you, can affect your entire game plan from the location, from the kind of launching of the Tata, of the, uh, Tata Nano plant and what happened there. So this is where this went to us. So the benefits of engagement are many, and that's why CSR is so critical, not just as part of, uh, of business continuity, but also taking care of the interests and the well-being of people. As we speak here, the one point we'd like to articulate is the CSR needs to be connected with the business, need to throw back to the business. Unless we do that, unless there's a connect with these, it will not sustain there. And in the kind of couple of examples we're giving here, and this it's part of the CSR policy that the Schedule 7, the top of the Companies Act and the reason why we need to invest in CSR. But some of the best case studies are in India. There's a JSW group that has actually conducted an appropriate need assessment to the communities around their direct impact zones. The social initiatives has focused on skill enhancement as an outcome of the need assessment. And that's how 3.5 thousand skill schools and certified BPOs to provide local employment and digital has been part of the skilling there. It's an interesting case study and also one at Project Shakti at Unilever where Unilever has trained women micro entrepreneurs, they call it the Shakti Amas, to sell the entire products. We saw a case study of ITC and we also see how women have been trained in marketing, sales, accounting and even introduce some of them to the formal banking system by transferring funds to the bank accounts there. And so the entire Shakti has in a nice way spread across the entire you know, states out here, the 18 states. So the two case studies speaks about how CSR can help you sustain business and also feedback to the community and also support the business. So the important point we want to stress here is how well this connects with the business out here. Across the APAC, and this is the APAC session we're having, a lot of industry initiatives, some of the ones that we're speaking about, Ambuja Cement talked of skill development and health. In a Thai sugar and bioenergy system, uh, in this company, it worked with local authorities to empower farmers in solving key in farming problems to, by adopting tech to increase productivity across the villages there. So you can see it's helped CSR connect with businesses, help them solve their farming problems. Saudi Aramco has deployed and focused on the agile community, develop a residential community for its employees there, looking at environmental design and also commercial development in a typical previously barren land in a kind of desert they created in OSS. We have one more health example of uh, the uh, Commonwealth Serum Laboratories in Australia, which looked at patients, communities, and local communities, the entire value chain, how the CSR has gone across 
the communities and how they have engaged local stakeholders has been the key talking point in some of these initiatives of TIA. So the key of, and again, this is important to talk about this, we can't talk on a social uh, bottom line with the talking of the stakeholder engagement. They are key to the entire purpose there. Why is stakeholders key? So what is stakeholders? So stakeholders are, like I said, it's all about stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholders and need to understand the internal and external stakeholders. And this, again, is best amplified by a case study from Mariko. Their code of conduct has been designed to ensure that the business is conducted in an ethical and sustainable manner. How do they identify this? They run this across the stakeholders. So who do they run the code of conduct? And sometimes you do it internally. But what about your vendors, your partners, your external organizations, your suppliers? So this is where identifying the stakeholders also helps you understand how we can roll out some policies, some approaches. Understanding the stakeholders also means that while you normally look inside out, you try and understand the external perspective. What is it that influences them and what is it that's relevant to you? Unless you do a combination of stakeholder engagement, we spoke about the materiality in E and now the S. This is where it's important to ensure stakeholder capitalism there. As the example in Mariko, they also train the coconut value chain, farmers in scientific implementation of tech practices and the sunflower value chain to help them look at seed development, testing, propagation, and extending classes to improve yields. In some ways, you can see identifying the right stakeholder to take the feedback, to encourage them, be part of the journey is a critical part of ESNG here. So friends, we, take, we took you to some of the frameworks when you looked at the deep dive into the E. We looked at the CDP, we looked at uh, perhaps the SASB. And here, the typical framework that matches well, and this began with the Millennium Development Goals that looked at poverty, hunger. You can see the first five SDG goals are largely towards the social element, but all of these is what companies seek to align with as a platform there. The SDGs is what helps us understand and align with business. We just came back on a talk on CSR. How do you connect that with business? How do you connect that with the SDGs? If you have to look at the mapping and connects, it's not all just social, but there are elements and shades of E, S, and G in each of the 17 sustainable developmental goals. There is another social platform which largely looks at uh, you know, one relevant, one likely to share as part of the masterclass series. We want to give you a focus and awareness, if not a deep dive into each of the frameworks there. The UN Global Compact has 10 principles. The four pillars are human rights, labor standards, environment, and anti-corruption. You can see that each of these, and we also give an example of the BRSR and how the uh, principles of the BRSR, the nine principles also connects there. So this is another key platform you can look at to connect with in terms of looking at ESG there. To demystify all of these, all the platforms, be it the BRS we spoke about in the last, or the UN Global Compact, we just spoke of the SDGs, all of these are interconnected there. So the UN Global Compact and the SDG, all of these are well mapped there. If you look at the four principles we just mentioned on the human rights in uh, Ember, the labor in blue, the environment and the anti-corruption and the green and uh, red. So these you can see are very well connected. If you look at the connects there, uh, they are very well linked with the SDGs. So each of the principles are very interconnected. You can draw parallel there. And as we speak, just to mention in passing, there's a lot of the social as part of all the frameworks, including the GRI, which has GRI 403, 412, and the 413, uh, which looks at some of the critical uh, social components. Likewise, we spoke about the SASB and the BRSR and the integrated reporting. Each of them, the integrated reporting has a human capital and the human capital input and output there. So you can see the social is very well mapped in most of the factors there. And we have a couple of questions, we're not questioning why there. But again, one of the things we have here, and I'll come to the questions in a second. So the key takeaways in social friends are, you know, reporting an S is challenging. And it's the reason why, and I guess one of the questions is, it's minuscule, you're right. I think Suresh Tarva's point here is, reporting an S has the challenges. It's largely focused on the most popular one is sustainability of the environment or the operational reporting. So reporting an S, we explained, is challenging for various factors there. And people do need to look at how to focus on the S. The ultimate bottom line, they say, is profits. We'll talk, to, we'll talk of governance in the next session. But then it's all about the people. The planet will survive 
it's we who are at risk as the people and that is the most critical dimension so the s human uh, the material factors include like we spoke just to recap the employee health and safety uh, diversity equity inclusion human rights community development engagement and of course the csr the social programs help manage the reputational risk if you don't do it uh, there is uh, reputational risk that coming from there uh, we also had a quick snapshot of the global esg frameworks including the s metrics we spoke about the SDGs, the UN Global Compact, and also the connects of the social with the GRI, SASB, and of course the SEBI's BRSR, which all of us know is mandatory from this year. So these global frameworks, folks, give us a great opportunity to report both quantitative and qualitative social data there. Ayush had in his 10 minutes given a nice overview of how each of these, including stakeholder and engagement and materiality can also be mapped there and help us solve this problem around reporting S here. So that's been some of the key takeaways there. Uh, I know we've uh, short on time, but to try and cover some of the questions that's come up in the last uh, one hour. Uh, Divya, employers, employees, and workers. So I guess some of the standards there, the Factories Act, for example, some of the OSHA guidelines. Uh, the factory manager is the one, and the rest of us, all of us are workers. So I guess the definition of that would be the workforce. While they say employees and contractors, I think the extended workforce is what normally would apply there, Divya. Azim, uh, health and safety practices to integrate in EHS, in ESG, as a question that Suresh also has been asking. Yes, it's important to understand. And in a couple of companies we were with, they actually paused the sustainability reporting to manage the health and safety uh, of the organization because there are a couple of fatalities there. And I guess it's very important to realize that you can't do a business harming people. You can't do a business that impacts your own internal or external workforce there. So that's why it's important that health and safety be uh, connected with EAG. The advantage is EAG is a good vehicle for reporting. And I remember in this particular company, uh, when we didn't publish a report, uh, there was a customer that came up and the data analyst came up and said, why didn't why did you drop a year in reporting? Is it because you wanted to cover up for your fatalities for the bad record you had? So that is, you know, when you get into EAG reporting, openness and transparency and disclosures also drives EHS. So as Suresh, you're right, uh, social as part of the reporting is a minuscule part of what normally is reported. People do not focus so much on the S factor. And while they're on health and safety, there is so much of uh, information, so much of things to do. It's all about the people. Uh, this is the most critical aspect. And we hope that the beginning of disclosures being made mandatory, as we spoke in the last session, will help us get to the next levels of health and safety as well. And the social dimension will come to the fore here. Yes, Vidya, I think uh, Ayush explained this on suppliers. The suppliers also, the ESG of the suppliers is very critical. I don't know if you missed the last session. We spoke about how, in talk of net zero, how do we capture the entire scope one, scope two, and most important is scope three. If you're able to make a roadmap which factors in a scope three, and some of these, depending on the materiality of the sectors, could be most relevant to some sectors there, which is why if you're able to use the digital platform, you can understand that here. Yeah, the material advisor has a lot of attributes there. In the in the essence, uh, we could not take so much of time to display all of this. Yes, we will share all the slides. We will also share the recordings. But I guess what you said is correct. The material advisor helps us do it in a manner that is works here. You know why the stakeholder engagement and material assessment needs to be refreshed year on year. It's mandated even as per the GRI and also as part of the BRSR. So this definitely helps you. It's pretty comprehensive. We just tried to give you a snapshot of that. We'll be happy to tell you more on this year. So right, friends, that's been some of it. I know some of these are dated. Uh, some of the examples in the Tata Group is uh, 100 years old, perhaps the way that it has been. But these are examples that go beyond time. So that's the overall feedback that's the framework there. Right, friends, Alicia, I guess we're on time. Uh, apologies once again for the glitch. Uh, technology and uh, what it is on social can be a challenge there. but. A lot of the questions have been in the last couple of uh, master classes. Can we go back to part one and part two? Here's the opportunity, friends, and if you're able to uh, understand and look at these links, we'll be happy to share it in the chat also, Alicia, where you can go back to the QR codes and watch the recordings of what you missed, part one and part two, the deep dive into environmental, and hope that you will be able to cover up some of you who have missed these videos here. Yeah, Alicia. Yeah, thank you, Shankar, and uh, thank you, Arish, and thanks, everybody, for joining us as well. Uh, what do you see on your screen? Uh, Shankar, can you go a slide? Yes, thank you. Uh, what you see on your screen here is that if you've missed part one or part two, you can still go ahead and be eligible for the certificate, the master certificate. 
uh, on the left hand side is a QR code for part one and on the right you have one for part two. So please watch the videos, like them and write a comment of what you learned from each session. And if you do that, we will go ahead and you will be eligible for the certificate when you attend parts four and five. So thank you. Everybody. Thank you. And the alternate way, you can always follow the benchmark ESG YouTube channels for more. And you'll always be proactive rather than reactive. With that wonderful. Thank you, folks. Uh, once again, it's been a pleasure interacting with us as part of the social. It's a, it's a nice, uh, like a lot of the feedback that's come in from the participants shows that social is not the most happening part of it. We did a couple of sessions where you do the stakeholder engagement, identifying what is material to them. We also asked the CXOs of the C of the ESNG what's most critical to you, and it all comes back from the hats they wear. So we also like you to take this poll and let us know a little bit about the feedback, and we'll be happy to come back to you with some of the answers and some more when we deep dive into the G of ESG. Thank you, folks, for your time. Thank you, thank you, everyone. As you want, do take this post webinar poll. Happy to hear your views. You spoke about stakeholder inclusivity. We want also want to learn from you and see what we could do better. Thank you for taking this small post webinar poll. Stay well, stay safe. Thank you, everybody.